Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, merci et bienvenue uh, d'être ici au Centre de recherche et d'enseignement sur les droits de la personne à l'Université d'Ottawa. Uh, thank you very much for coming to the Centre. Uh, my name is Sonia Nigam and I'm the Assistant Director uh, here at the uh, Human Rights Research and Education Centre. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much for coming out on a snowy uh, March afternoon. Uh, here to talk uh, with us about disability rights, the conversation between international law and domestic law. Uh, bien sûr, si vous avez de la présent les présentations seront en, en anglais, mais si vous avez des questions en français, n'hésitez pas à, à les poser et on fera notre mieux pour uh, faire la traduction. So thank you uh, to our speakers, Harvey Goldberg, Vangelis Nikias, and Alan McChesney for coming and joining us uh, today for this conversation. Harvey Goldberg has worked as a policy advisor for 35 years. Currently, he's the team leader, strategic initiatives at the Canadian Human Rights Commission. In that position, he serves as a senior policy advisor on a number of key issues, including Aboriginal rights, race relations, and the rights of persons with disabilities. Mr. Goldberg represented the Commission at the meetings of the UN Ad Hoc Committee mandated to draft the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Since the adoption of the Convention by the UN, he's been active in national and international efforts aimed at ensuring the effective and timely implementation of the Convention. He has focused in particular on the role of national human rights commissions in the implementation process. So we're very happy to have Harvey speak with us today about the purpose of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and how it differs from other treaties. Uh, Vangelis Nikias has been active in human rights and disability issues for many years. Currently, he is working for the Council of Canadians with Disabilities, CCD, to raise awareness on the content of the Convention. During the United Nations negotiations of the CRPD, Vangelis represented the Department of Human Resources and Social Development Canada on the official Canadian delegation as a content expert. In the 1990s, Vangelis chaired CCD's Human Rights Committee and served on its Social Policy Committee. He has a background in adjudication, having served for nine years as Vice Chair of the Ontario Social Assistance Review Board. Vangelis believes that the implementation of CRPD can contribute to the attainment of an inclusive, inclusive and accessible society. This can be achieved on the basis of genuine collaboration between Canadian governments and an aware and mobilized disability community. Vangelis will be speaking to us about the role of advocacy groups in relation to the Convention and in working towards an accessible and inclusive society. Alan McChesney uh, was a visiting fellow at uh, the Human Rights Research and Education uh, in, from 2009 to 2012. His fellowship activity included guest teaching here at the University of Ottawa and at Queen's University on disability issues, as well as research on disability studies courses taught in North America and abroad, particularly interdisciplinary courses. Allen was awarded a Community Justice Leadership Fellowship in 2009 by the Law Foundation of Ontario related to his work in the development and delivery of professional training, university teaching, and public education in the disabilities field. In past years, Allen had taught at the University of Toronto, Carleton University, University of Ottawa, the University of South Bank, London, uh, UK, and Canada's Peace Support Training Centre. He's been a consultant on human rights issues for three parliamentary committees. In 2010, Alan co-authored a paper on university compliance with the Accommodations for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, which he presented at the 7th International Conference on Higher Education and Disability in Innsbruck, Austria. Alan participated as an individual expert during Canada's national consultations surrounding the draft convention on the rights of persons with disabilities. So if you can join me in welcoming our speakers today.
and I will now pass the microphone over to Harvey. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, very happy to be here to talk about uh, a subject uh, which is very important to me, uh, which I've spent, uh, I guess, about almost 10 years now uh, working on. Not only, it's not my only file, but I've been involved in the, in the convention since its early stages, so it, I think it's something very important and special that's happened in the world, and uh, that's why I'm happy to be here to talk to you about it. Uh, because I'm the first speaker, a, a bit of my presentation is going to be an overview, but I'm also going to focus on three subjects that relate to how the convention, which is international law, can become reality in domestic law. So first of all, why did we need a convention on the rights of persons with disabilities? Second, how does the convention, di convention differ from other human rights treaties? And finally, what are the roadblocks of the implementation of the CRPD in Canada? So the, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is the newest human rights treaty in the UN system. As I probably don't have to tell anybody, there's a whole group of uh, human rights treaties stemming from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I guess this is the ninth or eighth. Uh, it's, a, it's a comprehensive and integral convention. That is, it covers both civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights. It does not create any new rights. Uh, all the rights that are embodied in the convention are rights that already exist, particularly in the two uh, conventions that came right after the Universal Declaration, civil and political, and social, uh, economic, and cultural. Um, I have the, the next point I have here was, was it was an internet convention. It, it, the internet played an important role in the development of the convention, and that's very important, and I'll, I'll explain why in a moment. And it was the most rapidly developed convention, human rights convention, in the history of the United Nations. It, uh, the, the General Assembly adopted the resolution to draft the convention in December of 2001, and it entered into force in May of 2008. So by UN standards, that seems like a long time, it's seven years, <laughs> by UN standards, that's lightning speed. Um, and it was really quite an accomplishment because when uh, the idea first came up, when a few countries like uh, Mexico, Mexico and Ecuador first suggested this idea, it was not a popular idea at all. There was very little support for it in the United Nations. Most states said, why do we need it? It's going to take too long. It's too difficult. You know, we're, we have better things to do. There was very little enthusiasm. But nevertheless, it, it, became, it, it rapidly picked up speed. And now we have 155 countries which have signed the convention. That's out of 193 countries in the United Nations, and 129 have ratified it, which means that the convention is well on its, well on its way to be universally ratified, uh, which will take several more years, but it's likely that every United Nations member, with possible exception of the United States, will ratify the convention. Right, the Convention on the Rights of the Child has been ratified by every UN member in the world except the United States and Somalia. Somalia doesn't have a government. So, um, well, I talked about it being an internet convention. The thing that you have to understand about this convention is that it was, there was an incredible dynamic that developed around the convention in part because um, disabled persons organizations and people with disabilities could, uh, could gather through the internet and organize their interventions in the development of the convention. Uh, so the internet and uh, modern uh, information technology was very important. The process was unique because the convention, the ad hoc committee, right from the very beginning, invited 
uh, disabled persons organizations and people with disabilities to be involved in the drafting process as well as inviting national human rights institutions and that's the capacity I was there. So, you know, as I said, states are, the states were very reluctant. Uh, but what happened in the, in the process that went on is they got, uh, I think the, it's proper to say, they got sucked into the enthusiasm of uh, people with disabilities and disabled persons organizations for why the convention was, why it was important to have a convention and uh, why it should be a dynamic, comprehensive convention. So, I'm, obviously we don't have time, nor is it the topic here, to go through all the provisions in the convention. Uh, suffice it to say that the convention covers uh, every area that other UN conventions cover. So, and then, obviously, uh, specific areas with regard to disability, such as accessibility, inclusion, uh, etc. So it's a comprehensive uh, convention. It has some particularly special features, which I'm going to comment on in a minute. So why was it needed? As I said, uh, all these rights are already in UN conventions. People with disabilities are people in, uh, in UN speak. Uh, they were covered by all these rights. Yes, that, that was the theory. In practice, uh, in fact, disability or disabled persons was largely invisible. Uh, in international law, just as in most countries, uh, and many countries still today, they're invisible in, they were invisible in domestic law. That is, that they may have been, uh, in theory, rights holders, but they weren't treated as rights holders. And their situation wasn't seen as a rights issue. Uh, and that's one of the key features of the convention, which I'll get to in a moment. So th there was a, a need for a binding instrument to uh, bring the visibility of persons with disabilities into the fore in international human rights law. And that was, was, and I think is, working as an impetus to change laws on the domestic level. So if there's one thing that you have to understand about the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, it's the, what has become known as the paradigm shift. And that is that, as I was saying, Traditionally, in Canada, all over the world, and certainly at the UN, disability was seen as a medical problem uh, or a charity problem. People with disabilities were broken and they needed to be fixed. They were poor and they needed assistance. The convention quite explicitly and clearly uh, adopts a social model of disability which sees disability as a social construct. So it's not that people have physical limitations. Everybody has physical limitations of one sort or another. It's the environment that people live in that create the barriers to their inclusion in society. Uh, it's not an individual pathology. It's a social, uh, it's a, it's a social issue. So people with disabilities are people who have rights, are capable of claiming those rights, can make decisions for their lives based on their free and informed consent, and are active members of, of society. And those, in every provision of the convention, you will see those principles coming to the fore. They all are under, they're the foundation of the, of the convention. And it boils down to the words aren't in the convention, but the sort of the motto of the convention was nothing about us without us. That, uh, the convention is not only about people with disabilities, it has to be by people with disabilities. Uh, it is no longer acceptable for governments or for the United Nations to tell people with disabilities what's good for them. So how is it different from other uh, conventions? Uh, I already explained that there's a different, there was a different process and ethos. It wasn't just state parties. It was a, a whole dynamic of of groups, uh, and it still is. Uh, there's special provisions in the convention about monitoring. Uh, specifically, uh, the treaty monitoring process at the United Nations is broken. Um, usually the way treaties are monitored 
is uh, there are expert uh, treaty bodies which are made up, uh, they're not representatives of states, but they're experts in their field, and they receive uh, reports from states' parties on what they're doing about the implementation of whatever convention it is. Now that process is important, and in fact, I think the, the committee that was established under this convention uh, has been as effective as it possibly can be and has done some very uh, good things. The fact is that right now they only meet for three weeks a year. They have, at last time I, I counted, they have a backlog of 25 reports. They only can get to about four or five reports a year. They might get more resources and be able to do a few more. So that means that the, you know, like Canada, which is one year late in filing its report, if it gets around to filing its report in the next few months, it's likely not to be reviewed for, for five, six, seven, maybe eight years. So that's why I say it's broken. Maybe it'll be fixed. But what this convention provides for is domestic level, level monitoring by requiring states to establish both a uh, national coordination mechanism for the, the convention and also to have independent, independent monitoring bodies, which Canada has not done yet, but we're hopeful that maybe it will someday. The other uh, unique thing about it is most conventions, all conventions have what are called conferences of states parties, which is a meeting of all the countries that ratify the convention. Uh, usually those meetings are only held for very specific reasons. If, so, you know, if there's a special issue to discuss or whether if, there's, um, if they want to try and amend the convention. This convention provides for a conference of states parties and actually what it's become is a, a very much like the ad hoc uh, process where there's been a meeting every year in New York, usually in September, where states and disabled persons organizations and people with disabilities and UN organizations meet to discuss the progress in implementing the convention. So again, the, the Conference of States Parties therefore serves as a prod to governments and to the United Nations system to continue to move on the convention. So I, I'll just skip over this. So the Article 33 is, a, is the section that deals with monitoring and I could give a whole lecture on that, which I'm not doing now. So translating the, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities into domestic reality. Of course, that's where it really matters, as Eleanor Roosevelt said about the, uh, about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Human rights matter where people are. It doesn't matter in the, in the Assembly Hall in the United Nations or in Geneva. It matters where people work where people seek services, where people try to get on a bus. If it doesn't matter there, it's completely useless. So what are the roadblocks in Canada to the domestic incorporation of, of, uh, of the convention? First of all, federalism is a big issue. Uh, the United Nations doesn't know from federalism, but Canadians <laughs> know from federalism. So the, the fact is that many, uh, I would say the majority of the provisions in, in the convention are provincial and territorial responsibilities over which the federal government has little or no influence. So it's not just a matter of trying, you know, it's not just saying Canada has to implement the convention, you have to get everybody to implement the convention. So that's a big challenge. Uh, there's the non-incorporation of international law. Canada is a country where we ratify a convention but we don't, the convention doesn't automatically become domestic law. It only becomes domestic law if there's other laws that incorporate the principles of the convention. Now, in theory, when Canada ratified the convention, it said that our laws are in compliance with the convention. In reality, that probably isn't exactly true. There's probably a lot of instances where laws could be changed to better reflect the convention. Um, when I say weak jurisprudence, I don't mean jurisprudence about disability. In fact, the juris jurisprudence in Canada about disability is very strong. What I mean is the weak jurisprudence with regard to the application of international treaties in Canada and the la lack of mechanisms to enforce it. And finally, Canada has not appointed an independent mechanism.
to oversee the implement to monitor the implementation of the convention. Uh, Canada has not signed the optional protocol. There's an optional protocol for the convention which allows for individuals when they've when they've exhausted domestic remedies to uh, then uh, apply to the uh, uh, convention, the committee on the convention to hear their case. And uh, although Canada has signed on to almost every other optional protocol of this type, it has not signed this protocol and at the moment does not intend to. Um, the UN is definitely out of favor in Canada, so saying that this is a UN uh, human rights convention uh, in many sectors of Canadian society doesn't get you much traction. Um, there is a, a clear lack of leadership on disability issues, uh, certainly at the federal level and also at the provincial levels. There are not ministers responsible for disability rights. There are not ministers that speak out for disability rights. There are not uh, uh, parliamentary committees that deal with issues of disabilities. In fact, the, the standing committee that is now holding hearings on uh, employment opportunities for people with disabilities, that's probably the fir first uh, House of Commons standing committee that's done anything on disability in a, a decade or a long time. Um, and unfortunately, disabled persons organizations in Canada right now have been very much weakened because the federal government is withdrawing funding from almost all of them. Uh, I, the, the organizations themselves are strong, but without funding, it's, it's going to be very difficult for them to push for implementation of the convention. So uh, the path ahead. Well, the convention certainly sets a very good roadmap for, uh, for the way that Canada and other countries can realize and can achieve uh, a vision of inclusion, uh, independence, autonomy, and rights for persons with disabilities. I, overall, Canadians care about human rights, and because of the convention, international scrutiny will certainly increase on Canada as time uh, progresses. Uh, so there's a sunny path in the, uh, on the picture of the slide, uh, Vangelis, I have a sunlit path and we're walking down it into the sunny future, but uh, hopefully that will transpire. So it's that's my presentation. It's warm in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to turn the microphone over to Vangelis. I am very happy to be here with you and, um, and uh, share CCDs and uh, the advocacy perspective on the, on the CRPD. The motto of the Council of Canadians with Disabilities uh, is a voice of our own. During the negotiations of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, nothing about us without us became progressively um, the, unifying, the unifying force the common reference point around which increasing numbers of uh, people rallied. Nothing about us without us not only influenced the elaboration of the convention, it is in fact uh, written into its provisions, uh, including Article 4, which sets out uh, the general obligations agreed upon by states parties. <coughs> The document I'm using today to share with you this disposition is written in Braille. The writing and reading system that has enabled blind people around the world to partake uh, of the great, of the gift of literacy, a defining characteristic of civilized humanity. You may know that Louis Braille is now considered a national hero in France. He is also honored by blind and sighted people around the world uh, for his contribution to our collective and personal advancement. <clears throat> what you may not know, however, is that the establishment of the Braille system 
as the means of literacy for blind people has been the fruit, the outcome of a struggle that Louis Braille and other blind persons uh, for a good part of the 19th century. You see, for some time, well-meaning, uh, mostly sighted educators wanted to educate blind pupils using various symbols that, lo that looked appropriate to the eye of the sighted. The blind, on the other hand, um, advocated that what should surely uh, matter is what um, felt appropriate and effective to the touch of the blind readers and writers. I am not going to go into the details of these disputes known in history as the War of the Dutch, except to say that what links a voice of our own, nothing about us without us, uh, and the War of the Dutch is a common thread, that is, the effort by persons with disabilities to achieve self-affirmation in matters and decisions that affect our lives. This is the essence of today's disability advocacy movement. <clears throat> it has progressively come to adopt, adapt and articulate a human rights discourse. Currently, the most advanced self-representational organizations of persons with disabilities, both internationally, internationally and in Canada, espouse a human rights perspective. Canada. The Canadian story at the national level of this thread, the constant effort by persons with disabilities to achieve self-affirmation, has its own landmark. It is linked to what we hope many of you are studying, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Did you know that the first draft of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms did not include protection from discrimination against Canadians with disabilities? It was left to a then young organization, the Coalition of Provincial Organizations of the Handicapped, COPO, subsequently renamed as the Council of Canadians with Disabilities to take up the challenge of, pub, of uh, publicly arguing for inclusion. Quote, <clears throat> to fail to prohibit discrimination on the grounds of disability in any Constitution, constitutionally entrenched, uh, entrenched uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which does prohibit discrimination on the grounds of race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, or age, is tantamount to rejecting the fundamental humanity of disabled Canadians. The above words written by Alan Simpson in 1980, the then chairperson of the Coalition of Provincial Organizations of the Handicapped, uh, <coughs> were aimed at Canada's legislators who uh, at that moment were willing and prepared to ignore the rights of Canadians with disabilities. People with disabilities fought back and proved to the world that the voices of the uh, disenfranchised can make a difference. While the impact of Section 15 on our understanding of equality, non-discrimination and the kind of society we want is uh, evolving, we argue that if disability had not been included 
we would today face even more, ba more barriers. In other words, the Charter has had a preventative effect. It has empowered Canadians with disabilities along with other disadvantaged groups <coughs> to pursue our goal of an inclusive and accessible society. Inclusion of disability in the equality provision of the Charter made Canada one of the first countries in the world to protect the rights of persons with disabilities in the Constitution. Having participated in, C in the CRPD negotiations, I can also assure you that it had a tangible and positive uh, influence on the elaboration of CRPD itself. The Charter was one of the reference points during the elaboration process of CRPD. In fact, Article 5 of the Convention echoes recognizably our Charter and our human rights legislation. CRPD is the first UN human rights instrument of this century. Canada ratified it in 2010 following a unanimous resolution of the House of Commons and a wide consultation process. It is our view and our hope that CRPD will prove a useful instrument in the effort to achieve an inclusive and accessible society. Not, not only is CRPD consistent with our Constitution and human rights legislation in principle, it comes, in fact, to provide specific, concrete measures that can be implemented to give effect to the principles of equality and non-discrimination. Developing an implementation plan is, we suggest, the logical follow-up to ratification. It is also necessary if we are to make further progress in this historical transformational process. In Canada, working together over the last 30 to 40 years, the disability rights movement, the government sector, and other allies, we have made significant progress. CCD has compiled a record of this effort in an anthology called Celebrating Our Accomplishments, available at www.ccdonline.ca. The fact of the matter is, though, that Canadians with disabilities continue to experience disproportionate poverty, higher rates of unemployment, lack of needed disability-related supports, and barriers to our full participation in society. According to the World, to the world Health Organization World Disability Report, more than one billion people in the world live with some form of disability. In his foreword to the uh, disability report, Professor Stephen W. Hacking, the internationally acclaimed theoretical physicist, states, quote, it, it is my hope that beginning with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities <coughs> and now with the publication of the World Disability Report, this century will mark a turning point for inclusion of people with disabilities in the lives of their societies. Why is a turning point needed? In CRPD's preamble, for example, states parties have recognized that persons with disabilities experience marginal marginalization, poverty, and discrimination. The situation is not limited to economically underdeveloped countries. In Eldridge, the Supreme Court of Canada has acknowledged that it is an unfortunate truth 
that the history of disabled persons in Canada is largely one of exclusion and marginalization. In order to address the above described situation, concerted action is required to change our society and to remove existing barriers. The views, the voice of persons with disabilities must be part of this process. States parties to the CRPD have agreed to this in Article 4.3 where it is stated uh, in the development and implementation of legislation and policies to implement the present convention and in other decision-making processes concerning issues relating to persons with disabilities, states parties shall closely consult with and actively involve persons with disabilities, including children with disabilities, through their representative organizations. We believe that the above state obligation is important because it formulates in international law a domestic practice which has proven effective. Without the voice of persons with disabilities, the Charter would not have included Section 15, in Section 15, the equality of persons with disabilities. Article 4.3 of CRPD is really a contribution to the concept and practice of democracy. In fact, enabling the democratic participation uh, of organizations of persons with disabilities has also been uh, an important Canadian innovation. Much of the progress we have achieved thus far has been made possible through government support for the independent voice of persons with disabilities. There are signs that this approach may be at risk. It is imperative, therefore, for Canada to continue to support representative organizations of persons with disabilities. We suggest that such support is also called for by CRPD's Article 29, which states in part, states parties shall guarantee to persons with disabilities political rights and the opportunity to enjoy them on an equal basis with others and shall undertake to promote actively an environment in which persons with disabilities can effectively and fully participate in the conduct of public affairs without discrimination on an equal basis with others and encourage their participation in public affairs, including forming and uh, joining organizations of persons with disabilities to represent persons with disabilities at international, national, regional, and local levels. This position of, sa of safeguarding the independent voice of persons with disabilities is closely linked to another of the principles um, articulated in CRPD. In Article 3, states parties have agreed on the importance of um, respect for inherent dignity, individual autonomy, including the freedom to make one's own choices and independence of persons. We strongly believe uh, that enabling the collective self-representation by persons with disabilities is inextricably linked to the exercise of choice and autonomy. While I'm on the subject of uh, CRPD principles, let me share with you another principle, D. It states, respect for difference and acceptance of persons with disabilities as part of human diversity 
and humanity. This is important because it marks at the level of a United Nations Convention the paradigm shift uh, from the long entrenched understanding of disability as a deficit and a deviation. Let me now put forward our views in relation to three key issues of implementation. They are the issues of compliance, progressive realization, and monitoring. In Article 4 of the CRPD, states parties, including federal states, have undertaken to ensure and promote the full realization of all human rights and fundamental freedoms, freedoms for all persons with disabilities without discrimination of any kind on the basis of disability. To this end, states parties undertake um, to adopt all appropriate legislative, administrative, and other measures for the implementation of the rights recognized in the present convention. This is a very significant and key commitment as a whole. I do, however, want to underline two phrases in particular. Full realization of all human rights and for all persons with disabilities. This undertaking places firmly on the agenda the question, and it is always a question of whether we are achieving full realization for all persons. In other words, whether we are in compliance with an international uh, human rights instrument, an instrument that is consistent with and, in fact, inspired by Canadian human rights principles, and an instrument that we ratified only three years ago. The question of compliance, I submit, uh, must be considered in a context of change. To some extent, this is captured by the principle of progressive realization, but the context of change involves other aspects. It involves changes, uh, possibly in our legislation, and certainly in our practices. Otherwise, we would have to conclude that we have already achieved nirvana for Canadians with disabilities. Would anyone seriously claim that? Or would anyone argue that we are a static society? For one um, thing, technology, technological progress creates new opportunities uh, for access, inclusion, and participation. And unfortunately, if we are not vigilant, it also creates new opportunities for barriers. The idea of change is built right into the convention itself. Let me mention uh, here some specific examples. Disability itself is understood as an evolving concept and it always occurs um, in interaction with the environment. The relevance of technological change is recognized in Article 4, where states' parties have agreed uh, to undertake or promote research and development of and to promote the availability and use of new technologies, including information and communications technologies, mobility aids, devices, and assistive uh, technologies suitable for persons with disabilities. To reiterate then, existing barriers to full participation must be removed. New barriers must be prevented from coming into being. And in order to accomplish all that, we must not hesitate to make changes at the legislative uh, 
policy or practice levels. In relation to social and economic rights, Canada has the obligation to take measures to the maximum of its available resources, Article 4.2 of CRPD. And in accordance with Article 28, persons with disabilities and their families have the right to an adequate standard of living and to the continuous improvement of living conditions. I draw your attention here to the adjective continuous. It is CCD's view that in the CRPD, that CRPD sets a framework for new policy uh, development and creates a government obligation through the progressive realization clause for continuous improvements and um, removal of barriers that will make Canada more inclusive and accessible. Progressive realization is not a postponement strategy, but rather a positive obligation for moving forward to improve the status of Canadians with disabilities. This is the combined effect of Articles 4.2 and 28 of the Convention. CRPD in Article 33 contains um, a definite role for persons with disabilities in the monitoring of the Convention implementation. It states, civil society, in particular persons with disabilities and their representative organizations shall be involved and participate fully in the monitoring process. CCD and other disability organizations have already endeavored to fulfill the role envisaged in the above uh, provision. We have provided concrete and uh, constructive comments uh, to the outline of the first Canadian report. We understand that the report is now in the final stages of approval. Consistent with our record, we will review it and comment on it carefully with a view to advancing the attainment of an inclusive and accessible Canada. Toward this goal, CCD currently ma is making an effort to inform the disability community of CRPD's content and assist the community to advocate for itself, for policies and measures that meet its needs and its hopes. We do, we do so based on our experience that an informed disability community is an empowered agent of change and social transformation. In conclusion, I would say that based on our experience, including the elaboration of CRPD, the role of advocacy groups is indispensable to achieving an inclusive and accessible Canada. <clears throat> Without self-representative groups of persons with disabilities, our experience and our needs cannot be adequately and legitimately described. Appropriate solutions cannot be developed uh, and diffi difficult challenges cannot be taken up. The, char the charter initial exclusion and subsequent remedy attest to this position. Thank you. And uh, we have uh, some experts on the uh, convention here in the room, uh, probably several um, whose identities I don't know, but we have uh, Ravi Malhatra. I know he has expertise with respect to uh, um, employment issues and uh, education issues with respect to the uh, convention and how it might be implemented in Canada. Mona Paré uh, has expertise in the education field and certainly with respect to uh, the rights of children. So I'm looking forward to the exchanges that we have with uh, participants who are on that side of the table. 
Uh, I don't have a sunny future to uh, show you or describe to you uh, the way Harvey does, but here's something sunny for you. I'm going to talk for only about 10 minutes. <laughs> so you can look forward to uh, more interactive uh, ideas in a short while. Uh, my uh, colleagues have uh, spoken about uh, some of the things that Canada could be doing, some of the things that uh, Canada um, agreed to do by ratifying the convention. And uh, we might think that uh, in this era of um, economic downturn, uh, particularly for uh, countries of the West or industrialized countries, uh, the majority of populations in many countries probably haven't noticed any difference because their economic and social and civil and political rights uh, haven't been realized before the economic downturn uh, nor now. But uh, governments can use the um, lack of revenues uh, or uh, other reasons for um, not spending as much as we think would be uh, important to promote uh, what the convention asks for within countries uh, that have ratified the convention. So I should tell you that uh, another country with a similar uh, legal background, similar linguistic and uh, democratic traditions, uh, namely New Zealand, has done a great deal uh, since uh, ratifying the convention and, and it provides some examples for Canada. Um, Harvey and Vangelis uh, know that uh, New Zealand has uh, implemented some of the uh, monitoring promises uh, that are, are made by any country that uh, ratifies the convention. So for example, uh, New Zealand has uh, a government mechanism, that's one of the monitoring and enforcement mechanisms required to make sure that you live up to your promises. Uh, they've got a coordination mechanism within the government. That's uh, one of the obligations under the convention. Uh, they've got an office for disability issues, Canada does as well. Uh, that office for uh, disability issues is the focal point within the New Zealand government with respect to, to disability. Um, and uh, New Zealand has a, a national disability strategy as well. Um, so New Zealand also has uh, an independent monitoring mechanism, which again is required under the convention. Um, that dis independent mechanism is actually implemented by cooperation among three bodies. The Human Rights Commission uh, of New Zealand, I'm sure, is doing things very similar to what the Canadian Human Rights Commission could do. Uh, the Canadian Human Rights Commission is the leading national body on promotion uh, and uh, protection and public education concerning uh, human rights in Canada. Um, and so it could perform similar roles to that performed by the New Zealand body. Uh, New Zealand also has an ombudsman that uh, focuses on uh, human rights uh, violations or allegations of violations with by the public sector, by the administrative bodies of the public sector. And then there's a, a convention coalition. That's a grouping of organizations of people with disabilities who monitor the rights of people with disabilities in New Zealand. And uh, a couple of years ago, almost three years ago, the government of New Zealand created a budget to make sure that these bodies had adequate funding and no doubt they would say that th they could probably use more resources but at least the government did create specific funding to uh, assist in them uh, monitoring uh, what the government is doing and promoting better implementation of all the promises that you've heard from uh, my colleagues with respect to the uh, national or domestic implementation. Oh, and they've uh, published a joint report on their monitoring activity so that the general public and interested parties such as you in New Zealand uh, can keep track of promises made and promises kept or not kept. Now, uh, 
uh, it's very important to have uh, budgetary support for non-governmental organizations to uh, be able to have uh, enough wherewithal to keep track of what the government is doing, governments in Canada's case. As Harvey said, uh, most of the, um, the obligations under the uh, convention fall within provincial and territorial jurisdiction, education, health care, uh, two obvious examples, and, and most forms of employment as well. Um, and so if you have a situation where governments are reducing financial support for uh, advocacy organizations in the disability field at a time when they have this new uh, interest in uh, getting national or domestic implementation of the, the convention, it's obviously uh, not a good situation. So in New Zealand, where there's um, increased funding, um, it's obviously a better situation. Uh, Australia also has made some new funding available, specifically to enable non-government organizations to uh, keep track of what the government is doing in Australia's national report and uh, the various stages of drafting that. Uh, I presume that will enable non-governmental groups to be present when the report is discussed uh, at the UN and be able to make uh, oral as well as um, written uh, communications where they might differ from uh, the government's view of things, for example. Canada used to have that. Uh, this uh, Human Rights Centre used to be part of uh, a coalition in Canada that gained access for non-governmental groups to go to the United Nations uh, and uh, make speeches and be in the corridors regarding implementation of some of the pre-existing uh, human rights treaties that uh, uh, Harvey has spoken about. Uh, that sort of support doesn't exist in Canada now, but obviously it can because Australia and New Zealand have been able to do that sort of thing. How am I doing for time? Pardon? A couple of more. Okay. Um, and within Canada, if we had a national coordination, a serious national coordination among uh, senior levels of government, uh, provincial, territorial, and national, which has existed in the past f for implementation of other uh, UN human rights treaties, then uh, that might help in spreading ideas across the country. For example, uh, Ontario has. Um, the Accommodation Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act that shares philosophy with uh, the UN Convention. Um, organizations of people with disabilities were involved in designing the standards or rules underneath that uh, provincial statute and uh, are involved in uh, monitoring its implementation. There are rules or standards specifically with respect to uh, employment, customer service by both public and private bodies, businesses, uh, information and communications, uh, and to a limited extent, extent uh, the built environment. Uh, and uh, those ideas are of uh, preventing barriers and setting aside uh, barriers uh, are being bored in Manitoba, for example. It could be bored across the country. Ontario needs to, to strengthen what it already has um, by, for example, maybe having future standards on education and health care and certainly stronger enforcement of the standards that are already present. Uh, but So implementation and strengthening of those standards within Ontario uh, and elsewhere would help to implement uh, the UN Convention's uh, obligations. Uh, the UN Convention, similar to Ontario, has involved people with disabilities throughout and also has the philosophy that you've heard of where um, disabilities are created by societal barriers that haven't been removed uh, in interaction with, uh, with individuals rather than uh, being part of the individual and so can be uh, removed and worked on uh, over time. That's, uh, that's my time. Uh, I'm sure I could say a lot more, but I want to hear, as my colleagues do, uh, what everyone else in the room have to say, has to say uh, about this. Thank you. Well,